Hey everyone, this is Sarah Norton. I'm Will Norton's sister, and I know this isn't the kind of video I normally do, um, but I just wanted to give you guys an update of what's been going on in my life. I'm sure a lot of you have heard the story about Will Norton, Will the Beast, and the Joplin Tornado as well. I'm Sarah Norton, and I'm his only sister, and um, I just wanted to tell you what I've been going through these past two and a half weeks, I guess it's been now, since the tornado, and I'm just going to try to tell you the whole story from my perspective. Um, as you can see, I'm in Will's room right now. Um, it's kind of hard to come in here. It's kind of weird uh, because he's not here anymore. Um, also, if you've heard the story, you know that uh, Will went up to heaven on May 22nd at around 5.30 p.m. when the tornado struck. Um, my dad was with him, and he is alive, thank goodness, and he's fine. He finally got to come home after two weeks. So, um, I'm just going to try to tell you the story from the very beginning. Um, from my perspective and then I'll fill in what needs to be filled in from my dad's perspective or whatever. My brother was 18 years old. He was graduating from high school, Joplin High School, on um, May 22nd. We were getting ready for graduation and so uh, Will just came downstairs, you know, like a normal day and said, hey, alright, I don't have to be there for a little bit but you guys should go on and get our seats safe. So we said, okay, alright, see you later, love you. And um, that's actually the last time I saw him that close. Um, and so then we just left and we went to graduation. So we got there and we saved our seats. It's a huge graduation, like 450 kids graduated. And so uh, it took a little while and then afterwards we were supposed to meet Will outside uh, to take his picture, get close-ups and all that because it's hard to get close-ups with all those kids graduating and they just go through the stage really fast. And so um, we went outside and then the tornado started, siren started going off and it started raining and we were like, okay, well, let's just go home. The tornado siren stopped going off in about 30 seconds and we were like, okay, no big deal. I'll preface this with, um, here in Joplin, Missouri, we have a tornado watch, which is less than a warning. A warning means, um, I think a cloud has been spotted and you should take cover, but a watch just means that the conditions are right for maybe a tornado cloud to form. So, if you didn't go anywhere when there was a tornado watch, um, you would be inside every single day in the spring because literally we have tornado watches every single day. So, um, the tornado watch on my phone, like, I just checked the weather channel in the morning, and, I, and it said, it had one of those little severe alert things at the bottom, I clicked on it, it said, tornado watch, um, from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., so I was like, 12 hours, you know, whatever, there's not going to be a tornado, have these every single day. So, um, then the tornado started, started going off at Missouri Southern State University, which is where their graduation was, and we were like, okay, my mom, um, Whitney and me, we said, okay, well, we're just going to head home because we had a graduation party planned for Will and we had lots of people coming over. We had food catered and all this stuff. And so we said, we're just going to go home. Um, just meet us at home. So my dad, Mark, and my brother, I never saw my brother at the school. Like, I never saw him again once he walked across that stage. So then my dad just waited on my brother to get out and rode with my brother home in the Hummer. And so my brother is Hummer H3. I'm sure you've seen videos on it. Um, also, if you didn't know, my brother um, has videos here on YouTube. It's youtube.com slash will, and he goes by wildebeest. <laughs> it's also youtube.com slash wildebeest, 88883333, but um, YouTube gave him youtube.com slash will as well. My dad called us on the way home, and he said, and oh, by the way, after the tornado signs went off for like 30 seconds at Missouri Southern, I never heard them again on the way home. Like, I rolled down my window the entire time. We were going pretty fast because I was like, you know what, we just need to get home before it hails. We don't want to hail on our cars and all this stuff, so... um. We never once heard the tornado sirens after that, and Missouri Southern is a long ways away from our house, like on the other complete side of town, so it's kind of weird that we only heard them 30 seconds there and we never heard them again. So um, my dad called me and we were almost home, he said, alright, we're on 15th Street, we'll be home in like 20 minutes, just um, make sure you open the garage for us, we're going to pull right in. So I was like, okay, no big deal. Well, then we started getting closer and we saw the sky, um, remember it's me, Whitney, and my mom in the car, and I was driving my mom's car. And um, we saw the sky, the sky get so dark and as we were coming to my house and so I um, just decided that they were like, you know, you need to just get home fast. So I ran this red light, which I would never do. Um, and then I was going like, I think it, I got up to 80 on this hill up to my house. If you're from Joplin, you know, like there's this hill that goes up to my house. And um, we opened the garage door, pulled in the garage and then trees started blowing in like on my mom's car and so the electricity went off and we couldn't close the door. Later I found out like the lady who was at my house, my mom's friend who was setting up the party, Charla, she said, well um, the electricity went off and then it flickered on and then it went off again. So when it flickered on is when we hit the garage door opener and the garage door opened. Is that a miracle? Like what if we'd been stuck outside while the tornado was happening? And so um, I couldn't open my 
brother's garage door like my dad told me to and he called again and um i said dad i can't open the garage door just pull up outside and just run in um, my mom's garage door won't close and so my dad could barely hear me on the phone and we talked and i was trying to talk to him i said dad are you there can you just answer me please are you there are you there and so um finally i heard him say will because will was driving my dad was in the passenger seat of his h3 and um i finally heard my dad say will pull over pull over pull over he goes there's the tornado pull over and then I just heard this wind suck them up, and I could tell it was really bad. I could tell it wasn't just outside the car somewhere. I could tell that they were getting blown up in the tornado. They were getting sucked up, and I could hear glass and everything. And then finally the phone went dead, and I was kept saying, Dad, can you hear me? Just tell me you're okay. I love you. Can you hear me? And so then um, the phone went dead. And so my mom and Whitney and I are just sitting at home, and we're like, okay, well, what do we do? I don't know how to you know, I don't know what to do. And so all these people kept coming to our house saying, are you okay, are you okay? And so the tornado just like barely went in front of our house. Like it barely, barely missed us. Like we're probably the closest house to the tornado on this side of town that that didn't get demolished because the houses across the street were completely total, like completely flattened, debris everywhere. I'll show you a picture of these. Um, I'm gonna try to go out and shoot some video of the town. I don't know, it probably won't capture it as well as it really is in person, but I'll try. And so, um, those houses are completely gone. Everything's gone in them. Our house, just some shingles were ripped off. A huge tree in our front yard was uprooted. Um, like, our gutters got torn off. Stuff, trees flew in the pool. I mean, really not bad damage at all. Like, really, our house is fine. And I'm not trying to say anything happened to our house. I'm just saying, like, it was so, so close to our house. Like, it's a miracle that we made it inside the house in time. Because if we would have been outside, I don't know if we would have lived. And if we hadn't run that light, I don't know. We would have been in the same position as my dad and brother. We would definitely, definitely would have been in the tornado. And so, that's just such a miracle. And I'm just so happy for that every day. That my mom, me, and Whitney, and her little unborn baby girl in her tummy are okay. And so then it was just a waiting game. At that point, it was like 5.30 at night on that Sunday, the 22nd. We sent people out looking for my dad and brother because last time I heard from them, they were on 15th Street. So I told everyone, go down 15th Street and see if you can see them. Um, we didn't know how bad the tornado was because we couldn't really see all the damage from my house exactly. No one would let me leave the house or my mom, and my mom was freaking out. Everyone just kept going out and saying, we can't get anywhere. There's there's trees that cross the road. Um, there's all this, all these beams, wood, nails, like everyone was getting flat tires because, you know, you can imagine this tornado sucked up all these houses and every single thing that was in the house got thrown at people and got scattered all over the city. So nails and beams, wood, insulation, glass, everything you can imagine in a house got hurled at people who were outside or in houses. And so you couldn't get through any roads at all. And so finally, um, my aunt and uncle, my aunt Tracy and uncle Jeff, they found their car and it was like a block from our house which they got so far and since I talked to them on the phone and so um they took pictures of the car got everything out of it that was still in it the only stuff that was in it was in the glove box and um, it was just like the registration and stuff and so then they came over to our house which was just really close to where the car was and they were just crying and they said they couldn't have survived that there was no one in the car but it looked like they couldn't have survived and so we all just started crying and I it was just the first time I thought well maybe they didn't make it and like half of my family my dad and my brother like can you imagine half your family just being gone like the thing that most people don't understand about my family is that like we're all best friends and I'm not just saying that because it sounds good or because like my brother's gone now and I want to be his best friend it's like we really were best friends like, we would hang out on Saturday nights and hang out all the time like after, every day after school we would go to Sonic or Starbucks and get you know his favorite Sonic drink was an ocean water his favorite Starbucks drink was um, a <clears throat> grande white mocha and so we would always do that together and we would talk on the phone every day like I went to college and so we would talk on the phone we text every day and like when I came home we'd hang out all the time and we'd go on vacations together like we really were best friends like he knew more about me than any other person in the entire world and we would tell each other everything and um my mom and dad, we would always just, we'd always hang out with them and go on vacations with them and we we always just wanted to be together because we were all just best friends and so um, that was the first time that I really realized, well maybe my two best friends, my dad and my brother, are gone and like I, I don't know, it was so hard and so I cried for a little bit and I finally just was like, okay well if they're alive we have to find them 
And so um, my aunt said, okay, well, we need to go to the hospital because they're not in the car and we searched around there as well as we could. So we need to just go to the hospital and see if they we're there, if they're there. So um, we all went to the hospital. I think there were like maybe nine of us or something like that who were at my house at that time. Because everyone kind of came over. They had to go back ways. It was hard to get through. And so um, we all just went to the hospital. You couldn't get through the main roads because power lines were down and trees were in the road and all this stuff. So we went like some weird back way to the hospital. We finally made it. And the hospital is really close to my house, and I think it took us 30 minutes to get there. Normally, it would take less than five. Okay, so we go in, and it's just chaos. Like, we walk in the emergency entrance, and there's just people every... Like, I can't even explain to you what I saw in that hospital that night. Um, by this time, it was midnight on Sunday night, I guess, Monday morning. And so, we walk through the emergency room entrance, and you just see lines of people on beds, on chairs, laying there on gurneys, like on everything, and they have broken bones, their, bro their bones are broken out of their skin, they have blood dripping all over them, their skin's peeling off, like their mu you can see their muscles, um, their legs are gone, like it was just, I cannot even describe to you what I saw in the hospital that night. We finally find our way to the front desk and we say, okay, we're looking for Mark and Will Norton and they were driving and we can't find them and they're not in their car, so we're checking if they're here and they said, well, if people are unconscious, they don't know their name, they don't have ID on them, we don't know who they are and plus, people were shipped to 60 different hospitals um, and here's the list of hospitals that, no, we didn't get the list then, we got it later, a list of 60 hospitals to call to see if they were there. We're like, okay, great, well, we're going to give you their name and a little description and, um, then just tell us if you find them. And they say, okay, we'll go wait in the chapel down the hall and we'll come find you if we find them. And we're like, okay, yeah, right, you're not gonna find them. We'll just go wait down there because we don't know what else to do. And so finally, some lady who didn't even work there, she was just volunteering at the front desk, she came and found us and said, well, this was like an hour later, and she said, okay, well, we found Mark Norton and he's in the OR, which is operating room, getting worked on. And we're like, oh my gosh, my dad's alive. Like, that's amazing. And then in the same breath, she said, but he kept saying, your son's dead. And that's what she told my mom. So we, I got to be happy for one second about my dad being alive. And then we just broke down and cried because he said that Will's dead. Like, it wasn't confirmed or anything like that. He just, I guess, told someone that before he went into surgery. And so we're like, okay, well, that might not be true. He might not know. He might just have saw someone take him out of the car. You know, we don't know if that's true or not. But it was really hard to hear that my dad said that. And so, um, then we went, we were like, okay, well, at least dad is alive. So we went and we waited in the OR waiting room for, it seemed like six hours. I think it was just an hour. And then the doctor came out and said, okay, well, he, his leg was broken. His arm was, no, they didn't know his arm was broken at that point. His leg was broken and his bicep was torn. And then, um, he had to, his head, the scalp was off. And so we were like, okay, well, at least he doesn't have brain damage. Like at least he's okay. And there we were like, okay, can we see him please? And then. They were like, no, because he's in recovery. We'll take him up to a room later. My mom just like begged the doctor um, if we could see him. And then he finally said, okay, you can come with us, Trish, which is my mom. And so she went out there. She went back there to the recovery room, which they had like three people in a little curtain cubicle where they would normally have one person. And there were just people everywhere. It was just so crazy. And then my mom fainted, I guess. And so the doctor came out and got me. And he was like, can you come get your mom? And so I came in there. And then I finally got to see my dad. And he looked... Like, he, at least he was alive. Like, that was amazing. And so I kissed him. He wasn't awake yet. And I kissed him. I said, I love you, Dad. Um, I'll see you. We're going to go up to your room and we'll see you in a little bit. I love you so much. And then I went out and I got my mom. And we went up to his room. He got a room, um, like a private room. And then he finally, like, woke up and he said, where's Will? Where's Will? Where's Will? And we said, well, we can't find him. We don't know. But we're looking really hard. And... He said, well, I don't think he made it. I don't think he made it. I saw him fly out the sunroof. And we're like, oh my gosh. And so, um, you know, I didn't really break down until after we found out that he wasn't alive. But I just, like, the more and more I heard that, the more and more I just knew we had to look for him. And so, he just kept saying, well, Will didn't make it. Will didn't make it. And, like, that's so hard for your dad to keep telling you, his daughter, your, your brother didn't make it. He didn't make it. I was in the car with him and he didn't make it. So, um, finally we convinced my dad, you know, you don't know. You were in and out of consciousness. Like, you have no idea. He could have flown out of the car and he could be fine somewhere. Like, he could just be sitting somewhere. An ambulance could have gotten him. They could have taken him to Springfield. They could have taken him to St. Louis, Kansas City, Tulsa. Like, he could be at any hospital anywhere. Like, you don't, you don't, you didn't know that he was dead. 
and my dad was like, okay, well, we just need to look for him. So we called people, like every single person I've ever met, people I've met, people I haven't met before, and everyone was looking for Will. It's crazy how many people we had looking for him. And they were looking outside, they were looking at hospitals, we called every hospital probably 50 to 100 times saying, do you have a Will Norton? Okay, do you have this person, six foot three, dark brown hair, lots of freckles, straight teeth? Do you have this person? Do you have an unidentified person? Well, according, I guess HIPAA rules say that you can't tell um, people who call if you have an unidentified person. I don't know what the rule is exactly, but I just, they kept telling us that they, we can't tell you if we have an unidentified person. And so we kept saying, well, my brother's missing. We don't know where he is. Can you please just tell us if you have any unidentified males at all? And they just kept saying, we can't tell you, we can't tell you, which was so frustrating because we didn't know whether to look outside for my brother or look in a hospital. We didn't know. And then someone came, some doctor came up and told us, well, we saw Will Norton's name on the ER log. So we were like, oh my gosh, he came through here. And then they said, and then we have no more record of him. So that probably means he was transferred out. So we were like, wow, that's awesome. He was probably transferred to another hospital. And so we looked at all, all these other hospitals over and over and over and over and over again. And then finally, um, the CEO of Freeman, which is a hospital here, he came to our room. He's friends with my family. And he said, you know what? That log was from January when he had an EKG done on his heart. And um, he, we have no record of him being here. It doesn't mean that he wasn't here, but we just have no record of him ever being here on Sunday. And so we were like, okay, well, maybe he's still outside. And we kept looking outside and looking outside and we had thousands of people looking outside for my brother and we just couldn't find him, couldn't find him. We, they sonar the uh, little ponds across the street, the street from where my brother's Hummer was found um, two times and they, there was no one in there. And we, um, we took his DNA, well we took um, my mom, my dad, and my DNA, like you just do a cotton swab in your mouth, we took that along with his dental records. Um, his DNA, we got his toothbrush um, and some sweaty socks out of his closet. And we took all that to um, the morgue, and so we were just like, okay, well, we need to, if that did happen, we need to know if he's there. And then, um, so we didn't hear anything on that for a while, and then we just, it just kept, it was five days before we heard anything about him. So you can imagine, like, you didn't, we didn't sleep. My dad was in such horrible pain, like, he was hardly conscious at all. He would just, they would give him morphine, and he would go to sleep. And then he'd wake up in pain, and they'd give him morphine, and he'd go back to sleep. Um, now we found out that he has 15 broken bones in his body. His leg, his left leg here, both bones were broken and they were sticking out. And so um, that night of the tornado, they ran out of pain medicine. So he didn't have anything. He didn't have morphine or anything to dull his pain when they reset his leg and they had to push it back together. And my dad said that's the most pain he's ever felt in his entire life. And the doctor told him this will be the most painful thing you ever experienced right before he did it. And my dad said that was true. It was so painful. Like. He didn't have pain medicine at all. Um, his head, his scalp, like something just hit his scalp like this and almost took his whole scalp off. And so we had 22 staples around like this. Didn't have any pain numbing medicine at all for that. They just stapled it while he was conscious. Um, they said he lost so much blood. If he would have stayed there in the car any longer without the ambulance coming to get him, he would have bled to death for sure. Um, so the tornado happened around 5, well I was on the phone with my dad around 5.15 to 5.20 and then um, I have had contact with the ambulance driver since then and they said they picked my dad up at 5.36. So um, he wasn't waiting in the car very long. When they got to the car, um, my dad was trapped inside of it and um, my brother was not in the car. So um, they cut my, they had to get, um, I guess it was a fire truck there to, they used the jaws of life to cut my dad out of the car um, and he couldn't move because his arm, his, he had 15 broken bones like so um, they had to get him onto a stretcher like a little gurney and then put him in the ambulance and they, he said they picked up five other people on the way um, to the hospital and he was really close to the hospital like here's the hospital, here's my house and here's where my dad was like it was, it, it's all in I think maybe a mile radius so um, it was all really close together and he said they couldn't get through roads. They kept going over these logs and all in their power lines in the road. They had to go through ditches and my dad had 15 broken bones and he's in the back just as the ambulance goes through everything. He said he was in so much pain and they would stop to go over a log or something and people would just hand the babies that were hurt and um, he said there was a nine month old baby. Someone just handed the pers the driver that said please take her to the hospital and so my dad said it was just crazy and they were packed in the hospital and the ambulance and they couldn't really treat them at all because there were just so many people they were just trying to get them to the hospital 
And so, um, luckily, the ambulance driver found my dad so soon. And my dad kept telling them, my son's out here, my son's out here, go look for my son. And so they looked around, they looked as hard as they could, and they said, we can't find your son, we have to get you to the hospital. And so when my aunt and uncle found the Hummer, um, they made... They found some, um, I think, policemen, and they searched as hard as they could and couldn't find my brother. And so my dad said, well, he was kind of in and out of consciousness because he was losing so much blood and he was in so much pain that, um, like, maybe someone could have con come and gotten my brother already. Like, maybe he was, like, laying in the road and someone got him. I don't know. So there was still hope that we were going to find my brother. And then one day we got a call from my cousin who was calling all these hospitals nonstop, and he said, okay, well, there's an unidentified... 18 year old ish male in Springfield and he has dark hair so I, I called the ICU unit and I said I explained my brother I drove up to Springfield which is about an hour and 20 minute drive and um, just the whole time it was just so hard because my mom and I were there and then my dad's cousin Terry drove us there um, and because we couldn't drive obviously and the whole time we were like wow what if this is Will what if we found Will wow 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 and so um, finally my mom we decided that my mom shouldn't go in because I was um, calmer at that point and so I said I'm just gonna go in and I'm gonna see if this is Will because I don't want you to just become attached to this person just because he matched his description on the phone like we can't you can't grow attached to him if it's not Will and so um, I went in there and my heart was pounding and I turned turned and we went in this I think it was room 9 or something and um, we just went in and I looked over and then I just I just said to Terry I said that's not Will because I could just tell even though he was so bandaged up and everything. And so I went in there and I was like, you know what? He's going to be swollen and all the stuff. I said, I need to check things that won't, that will be with him forever. Like his teeth and his eyes and his freckles and all this stuff. And so I, I examined this boy. And so I just said, all right, this isn't my brother. I'm sorry. Thank you for your time. And so I just walked out and I told my mom. And it was really hard because we thought we found Will. But um, so we went back to Joplin. And um, this whole time I've been doing interviews on TV. I did one on Anderson Cooper on CNN. I did that twice and then I did a CBS morning interview and then my aunt did a Fox News interview. She did that while we were in Springfield trying to identify this, um, trying to identify Will. And so um, all these TV stations, we have all this publicity, all this media. I'm sure you've seen some of it. You can search for it. You can go to Anderson Cooper's blog and um, we're on there and then you can find some of it on YouTube. And um, so we were just trying every single thing we could possibly do to find Will. And so um, we even had like the Missouri Southern State football team call me and they said, we want to search for Will. And we had these Marines come up from Dallas and they said, we have all of our gear, we want to look for Will. We had all these fire departments, everything looking for Will. And I, I, we could not have done one more thing to search for him. I just kept thinking every night while I was sitting there looking outside the hospital with my dad, I just kept thinking, what if Will's out there? It's raining, it's hailing right now. What if it's hailing on Will? What if he's just laying out there somewhere? Like, we don't know where he is, he could have been flown anywhere. From the tornado and so that was just such a sickening feeling and then finally that Friday I woke up and I just said you know what I don't know if Will's out here anymore like I just if there's no more unidentified people because we kept hearing of all these unidentified people being identified and we were like how are they finding these people they won't give us any information we can't find Will are there just no more unidentified people or are they just not telling us it's the most frustrating thing I've ever had to experience while we were seeing the tornado, my mom kept yelling, Will, 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 I need Will, Will, Will. And she never once yelled Mark, which I thought was weird. I was like, you know what, do you care more about Will? I don't know. It was just kind of weird. And then um, and then finally she sat down on the stairs and she said, I can feel Will, I can feel Will leaving me. I can feel him leaving me. He's not here anymore. I feel Will leaving me. And I thought, you know, she was just going into shock. But it turns out, like, that's really when Will was leaving the earth and he was going up to heaven. And so it's really weird that, like, my mom could feel that. And, um, so, and she never yelled Mark because Mark was alive. He wasn't leaving us. And so, okay, so now we've searched for five days and it's Friday. And I'm breaking down and I'm saying, I don't feel well here. And so, that night, our pastor came to the hospital. My mom was in the hallway and she came in and she was crying. She said, Sarah, I need to see you for a second. And I said, Mom, did you find out something? What did you find out? And she was like, well, um, just come out in the hallway. And so our pastor said, um, they found Will and he's not alive. And so like, that's the hardest thing I've ever had to hear. The hardest thing I've ever had to experience. Like my best friend who I hadn't seen in five days, who I didn't know if he was alive. Like I had hoped that he was alive. was just not, he was just gone and he was in heaven. And it was just crazy to know that. And, um, 
so we went in and we told my dad and he was like he was you know he's all bandaged and all black and blue and his legs broken his arms broken his biceps cut his whole back's broken like he had so many injuries and so he just like got in so much pain and he was freaking out when we told him that he like had to they had to give him medicine and he went back to sleep and so that whole night he would wake up every couple hours like I Grant and I stayed in the hospital with him all 13 or 14 nights and so he kept waking up and he kept saying do we know about Will and I had to keep telling him yes they found him he's not alive and that was so hard to tell my dad over and over because he had the same reaction over and over again because he couldn't remember because they put him on so much medicine so finally he was remembering and then they said they found him in the pond like here's the street here's where the Hummer crap like here's where they found the Hummer and here's the pond and so um they found him in the pond. He was under a bunch of debris. It took three sonars of the pond for them to find him. So, um, that was really, really, really tough. My dad said he remembers, like, whenever the tornado first picked them up, my brother started reciting scripture and he started praying. And he wasn't just praying, dear God, please save us, please keep us safe. He was like reciting these Bible verses that my dad didn't even, we didn't even know he knew. Like I knew my brother knew a lot about the Bible because I'd always ask him for advice and he'd always be like, well, this is what God tells us. But I never knew that he like really knew scripture and maybe he didn't. Maybe it was just God talking through him saying, you know what? I have your son, Mark. I'm taking him with me. He's safe. Um, so like, that's what one of our pastors says. He keeps saying, you know what? If you, you're one of the only people in the world who has ever heard God speaking through someone as he's taking him up to heaven. And you know, like, I don't know what to believe. I kind of, I do believe that, that God was giving him these words to say and like, God was taking him and he's saying, you know what, will safe with me. Nothing bad can ever happen to him. And my dad said like so much stuff was flying through the windows, the car and like all the windows, like the first window that broke out was Will's window and like all the windows were out of it and it just, the tornado just sucked him out and all the stuff from the houses, like beams and boards and nails kept hitting them in the face and just hitting their bodies and then my dad put his arms around Will and um, my brother's seatbelt broke, like something like glass or some, a board or something probably hit it and broke it and then he just flew out the sunroof and then that's the last time my dad ever saw him, that's the last you know, time anyone ever saw him and um, my dad it broke his arm and his, it broke his bone in his arm and it ripped his bicep. He was holding on to my brother so tight. And like, if that doesn't show you what love is like, I don't know what does. And so, um, that was the last time he ever saw him. And, um, you know, I'm just so thankful because my dad almost rode back with us. And, um, my brother was almost by himself, you know, he would have been by himself and he would have been so scared. And so I'm just glad that, like, even though my dad's really hurt, I'm so glad that he was with him in the car, that he had someone with him, and my dad told him he loved him before he died. And the thing I told my pastor was, like, it doesn't, it doesn't matter, like, that I didn't get to say one last thing to him, or I didn't get to hug him one last time, because, like, every single day, whenever, like, whenever we go to sleep, we would say, love you, and then whenever he would, like, or I would leave, or someone would leave the house, we always say, all right, see you later, love you, and they would always say, love you back, and... Like, every time I went down to college or I got back, I would give him a huge hug. And, like, it's not like we ever fought. Like, none of us ever fought. The only thing we ever fought about was, like, his hair. Like, my mom always wanted him to get his hair cut, and he didn't want to. And, like, that is honestly the only thing my family has ever fought about in our lives. We don't fight. It doesn't matter, like, if someone's right or someone's wrong. Like, it, we don't care about that. It's just about, like, being together and loving each other. It's really amazing how much support we've gotten um, online and through um, our Facebook page that's um, Help Find Will Norton. We had 50,000 people like that page. Like, that's insane. He has 50,000 people who are saying, we want you to be found, we want you to come back. And I've gotten so many stories from people saying, you know, I haven't prayed in 15 years, but I finally, I picked up my Bible and I started praying that Will would be found. And I've developed this relationship with Christ. And it's just amazing that one 18-year-old boy can do that, can have so much impact on the world. And his videos have gone crazy, and it's just, it's so, so crazy. And so that's basically the story from my side. We had this really beautiful celebration for Will. We didn't want a funeral. We just wanted a celebration of his life because he wouldn't want people to be sad. So um, we had his favorite. It was so weird because a few weeks before this, um, 
my mom said that Will told her, he said, you know what, if I ever die, I want the Jordan Howerton Band to play Amazing Grace at my funeral. And so, well, okay, of course we have to do that. And then um, my dad said he remembers thinking about a month ago um, that he just looked at Will and he said, you know what, if Will died today, he would have lived the fullest life imaginable. And really, my brother did more in his life than most people do in 90 years. It's so, so crazy that he was able to do all of this. Um, he's touched so many people. He's had this YouTube channel and he's just this positive influence on people. And he never drinks or does drugs or smokes or does anything bad like that. He always just like, he he's friends with everyone and he's nice to everyone. I've never heard him say one bad thing about anyone. Like sometimes he'll be frustrated with someone and he'll be like, I don't know why they did that. But he would, he would never say, they're a bad person, or I don't like them, or they're ugly, or anything like that. Like, he would never say that. And so, that's so crazy for someone to have lived that long and just never say anything bad about people. He just loved everyone. He wanted everyone to have a relationship with Christ. He wanted everyone to be happy. He wanted everyone to fit in. He was always polite and responsible, and he was just the most amazing person. Okay, so here's how I think about the whole thing. Um, I just think that... You know, God didn't want Will to die. He didn't say, okay, Will, you're going to die 18 years old um, because blah, blah. He didn't, he didn't say that. And so he didn't need Will in heaven. Like, how many billion people are there in heaven, you know? Like, he didn't need Will for some special job up in heaven. He, it's just, I think that we have free will, and God knows that these disasters happen, and people are going to die. And so he knew from the beginning of time that Will was going to die on May 22nd, 2011, and so I think he just planned his life to where it was the most full, wonderful, positive life anyone ever could have lived. He lived a pretty perfect life. Um, he was always happy. I never saw him. He was sad a couple times, but not as much as most people are. He was never depressed. He was never angry. He was never mad. He never said bad things about people. He always tried to help people. Like, if he saw someone who was hurting, he would give them his shirt or something. Like, he was so generous. He would give anyone anything. He volunteered at the Humane Society. I don't know anyone who can say that they've lived the kind of life that he has or impacted as many people as he has. And, like, all of his dreams have come true. Like, I think it was God saying, you know what, you graduated from high school. You were on your way home from graduation. You know, this was the last big celebration. You've completed your life. You've completed everything that I wanted you to complete. He got into film school at Chapman University, which is really hard to get into the Dodge um, Film School. And he, it's amazing that he, that was his lifelong goal, to go to film school. And you know, he didn't get to go to film school, but he got accepted into his dream school. And we went out and visited it a couple times, and he was just, he loved it out there. And so, he, he accomplished that. And you know what, his idol was Kat Von D um, from LA Inc. And um, she tweeted him. Um, one time and he just thought that was the coolest thing in the world. You can watch his video. I saw Kat Von D and he he loved that and you know um, after she realized that he um, had passed away she made this she drew this picture for him and she said in loving memory or memory of Will Norton and um, it was a picture of this girl crying and so like how amazing is that? I'm sure like I don't I always think oh I wish I could tell Will but Will already knows like he, he knows what's happening and um he has 50,000 50, likes on his Facebook page. Like, that's so crazy. And then um, he has 2 million video views on his YouTube. He's, like, accomplished everything he's ever wanted to accomplish. Even though, like, some of it was when he wasn't here on Earth, he still accomplished everything he wanted to, which is so crazy. Like, how many of us can say we've impacted that many people? So it's hard for me to be sad, and it's hard for me to ha be happy at the same time. But it's really hard for me to be sad because I just think of, like, he's in this wonderful place. He's in the best place you could ever be in. And I've never been more sure about someone going to heaven in my life. You know, like, his last moments, he was reciting scripture. Like, God was speaking through him. Like, how could you be more sure of someone going to heaven? He was always, he always tried to do the right thing. And he always would talk about God and go to church. And he was just, he loved, he loved God with all of his heart. And he was a savior. He truly believed that. And so... When I start to get sad, I just think, you know what? He's up there in heaven. He wouldn't want me to be sad. Like, there's no sadness in heaven. He can't be sad. So, um, and he knows that we're coming to him soon. I think time just goes by so fast in heaven, and he probably just thinks, oh, well, I'm going to see my family tomorrow. I'm going to go explore heaven and meet all these people that I've never met and 
meet these people who I lost early on in my life and I'm just gonna explore this place so that when my family gets here I can show them around and I can greet them and I'll just be so happy when they get here and I don't think he has to wait long you know because this life is so short um, compared to eternity in heaven he's in heaven so um he's in a good place it's just hard on us who are left here dealing with all of it but um it's okay because so many people here love him God loves him everyone in heaven loves him he will go through no more pain no suffering nothing he he's just in the best place ever so yeah that's something to be happy about he wouldn't want us to be sad